Okay, so I am already wanting to make an attachment to uh, Monday's first week's call. So uh, this will be posted in the YouTube um, as week one attachment A, week one attachment A, yeah. And there was a, a point that had come up during that particular Zoom where it was addressing um, the beliefs around money. And I know Heather had brought up a point on uh, the word content, being content. I think she had quoted, I know she quoted the Bible on that. I can't remember who it was, Paul or Peter or somebody like that. Um, and somebody else had mentioned that that was a point, a sticking point for them as well. And there's, as I kept thinking about that after, um, after the Zoom was over, there were some points that I had written down right away, and I'm just getting around to it today to be able to record this. However, I think it's a very, it's a super important point to be able to make and draw these contrasts. And so I'm not judging anybody in the reasons they think the things they think or the paradigms they have, or uh, I am so appreciative of people feeling safe enough to share, you know, the things that they're going through and, the, and those sticking points and, and the beliefs uh, that they feel like that are holding them back. So in no way am I um, like trying to point or pick somebody or pull somebody out of the, the crowd, so to speak, and, and say, look at how they're doing it wrong. That's not that at all. In fact, again, I just want to honor those that are speaking up because it allows us to be able to draw these contrasts. I'll use myself in many points on how I was doing things wrong and, and unknowingly, either ignorantly or just uh, not ready to release it yet and resisting letting certain beliefs go. Um, so again, I just want to frame that up at, that way first because I know that there are a couple people that help contribute to these afterthoughts that I had and how we can now all benefit from that. So, um, but I do have to be very kind of like blunt about it in depicting what those thoughts were. So there will be some um, uh, people that will, not, I'm not gonna identify people and say, this is the person I did. I don't even remember who, other than Heather, I don't remember who had made the comment in the chat box, but it'll be something for all of us to learn from. And, and uh, without wanting, hopefully not offending anybody, because that is not the intention at all. Um, in fact, it's actually spotlighting them and, and the courage that they have and, and the opportunity that their courage is giving us to be able to draw these contrasts, which otherwise we would not be able to. So the reason I had these thoughts were because of that courage that they show. Excuse me. So let me just read through here what uh, the thoughts were that were going through my mind to be able to answer and, and create some clarity for me around this particular point. And this is a point that there, there's some incredible subtleties to the human mind. In fact, I need to share my screen, don't I? There are some incredible subtleties within the human mind that will um, create uh, like justifying ourselves or or maybe recognizing the hard in making um, new behaviors and the new beliefs and there's some introspect uh, interest uh, uh, introspection that we do as individuals and in the book leadership and personal development or was it leadership and self-deception uh, they talk about even though you might be doing some introspection and taking a personal inventory and looking at things from the inside, we could still be doing that from inside the box. And this is those subtleties that the, the brain um, will frame things up in ways that don't serve us, like they keep us stuck. They keep me stuck the way that my brain is gonna work. And until we identify that and how it's doing that, we can't really take it on and we'll continue to remain stuck. So I think it would be helpful to just reiterate and maybe um, create some more clarity around being inside the box versus outside of the box. Some of you may have heard me, heard me share this and it's in leadership and self-deception where, in fact, if I go back to uh, this point right here. So 
um, there's always this opportunity for us to make a decision, right? So there was a decision that came up or just a, a thought process that came up during the call where somebody said, look, you know, like Heather brought up about, well, in the Bible, it says that we should be content with what we have. And then she did a great job of explaining that content doesn't mean satisfied. Like, it doesn't mean that that's the end and you shouldn't ask for any more. She did a great job of framing that up and really what the definition of content means. And I had brought up uh, that the, the Bible's been translated so many times. It was not first written in English, right? And it's just been through different translations that we, lo we lose some of the meanings uh, and they can be a little bit confusing or a little bit misdirecting uh, if, if we don't understand the context and, and, and then take other parts of the Bible that may, it, like if we take it out of context, there would be other parts of, uh, within the Bible that I've found that contradict the way that that was being interpreted, right? <laughs> Where the Bible talks so much about creating more abundance, like the talents and creating more talents and, and uh, overflowing, you know, pressed down in good measure and overflowing. Um, there's a lot of things that would contradict that perspective. But unless you have, uh, you can draw on those different uh, perspectives that are uh, brought out in the Bible, you might, that might be a sticking point for someone where uh, being content with what we have and not asking for more becomes the main focus. And, and then it would start to be an erroneous perception that's created around uh, that, that ideology around being content and shouldn't ask for more. Um, all right, so when that came up, there's, there's going to be, in, in the personal application that the individual will have as we're going through this dialogue on this Zoom about our isogenics business and applying these, these principles and these laws, um, there, there's going to be a, a, an opportunity for each individual, and, and more particularly in this case, that individual who, who said, yeah, I'm having trouble with that. I, I, you know, I, I hold my faith and my values and my beliefs uh, around my, you know, the religious orientation around that, which I do as well, very high. Like those are like the most important things. And if that most important thing is telling me that I should be living one way, that Dave's bringing up and, and Wallace Waddles and the Science of Getting Rich is bringing up a whole different, like 180 degree, like completely different perspective, there's some dissonance there. And if, if and and as it should be holding on to your closest, dearest values that you hold most dear to you, um, that should be the overriding factor, right? Of making choices in our lives. And so when it comes to some decisions and some behaviors that need to be made around building an isogenics business, which really building an, a successful isogenics business is synonymous with getting rich, right? So if if there's an erroneous perception of what that content means, being content with those values that I hold most dear, when it comes to making the decision, and this would be the one that goes towards this, taking this left uh, turn instead of the right turn um, in behavior, making the left turn internally inside our minds, right? Based on the values, we're gonna to cling to this one, which would be that I should be content in the way that that's framed up inside of the individual. It's gonna prevent them from taking the behaviors in their isogenics business that would lead to success because this would lead to uh, riches and wealth where that is in direct opposition to what this person is feeling inside with their values that they hold most dear, right? And, and, and hold as a priority. So. What, what they do then is they don't take the actions with their isogenics business. They don't take the behavior because they justify not taking that, whether it's subconscious or consciously or both inter, inter, intertwined. The behavior won't be taken because there's this deep-seated belief, even on a subconscious level, and it's the beliefs that always win out. And so the, the person becomes paralyzed whether they know it or not. The thermostat, that deeply seated belief, whether it's partly correct and partly incorrect, um, it, it's going to paralyze them in taking the behaviors that would lead to a successful isogenics business because it would be a complete contradiction to what that deeply seated belief in, uh, is here. Does it make sense? 
So there's a, there's a dissonance that develops. And so not taking the action, even though they know that would be a good action, this is where the dissonance and the anxiety and the frustration set in. They know that the, the, the actions in their isogenics business would lead to a better life for the individual they're sharing it with, yet there's this deeply seated perspective of that goes against become wealthy, becoming rich, and, and, and creating more abundance in your life by the behaviors and the actions you're gonna take. So do you see how like one's gonna win out? It's gonna be either be the one or the other. And typically the one that wins out is the deeply seated belief. Whether it's erroneous or not, whether it's a truthful belief and an accurate belief truthfully based on principles, and I'm talking God's principles, whether it's, 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 it, it isn't in alignment with God's principles, but you have framed it up in yourself as though it is, then this one's going to win out. Even though on the other side of it, do you see the, I think the words dichotomy here? It's, it's like, even though it, it's an impossible situation, if the deeply seated erroneous belief is, is the one that we're going to cling to, yet you know that sharing isogenics is something that is divine in nature. It's a win-win scenario for both you and the company and also the customer. The customer is going to have these amazing health benefits and they're going to save money. And so we can see how that's true. But there are these two opposing forces right here in the person's uh, mental makeup. And, and this is a physical thing that happens as well. And, and, and there are chemist, there's a chemistry that takes place in the brain right here at this deciding factor to go left or right. And, and so if this is that deeply seated belief, it will win out and you won't consistently do the behaviors. There's just too much of a dissonance. And there will be a chemical uh, reaction within the brain that will make it almost next to impossible, if not impossible, to consistently do the behaviors that would lead to a successful isogenics business. So on the one hand, you want this over here, but on the other hand, over here, internally in neural net, that is a kind of a hard wiring, it's, it's neuroplasticity, we can change that wiring, but it is kind of a hard wiring, even though we can snip those wires, so to speak, and rewire ourselves, it's kind of a hard wire right here. And so when we go against that hard wiring, it, it just, the amygdala and the brain chemistry and the emotions that are built up behind that will prevent us from consistently doing the behaviors that are counter to that deeply seated belief. And just because it's a deeply seated belief doesn't mean it's a correct belief in when we compare it to immutable laws, right? And I'm talking God's laws here. So uh, we can have beliefs that are contrary to the results that we would get if we were in harmony with God's laws, okay? And we can do that, we can, and that is the human, you know, I guess the, the challenge as human beings is to identify those and then know how to rewire that, right? And that's what this is all gonna be about, specifically with our isogenics business. So <clears throat> going back to, uh, and, and then, so being in the box, I, I do believe that this will be some helpful um, information and understanding being inside the box versus operating from outside the box, right? In leadership and self-deception, they talk about a, a married couple and the baby's born and uh, the wife is staying at home in this particular scenario, taking care of and raising the baby. And it's a newborn baby, right? And, and then the husband's working and, and being the provider and paying the bills and, and all of that. And, and those are those, that bottom level of the pyramid, right? security, warmth, clothing, shelter, food, and, and all those things that are essential and necessary. So they're both playing their, a, a, a specific role. Well, the baby's crying in the middle of the night, both you know, the husband and wife are sleeping, and the wife is completely spent. She's wore out because that is like a huge demanding job that is like there's no time to yourself. And, and, and so the husband hears the baby crying, but he's thinking, there's this moment of decision right here for the husband that he hears the baby crying and he gets this, that, that conscience that's within all of us, this light, this truth, and we, and we call it the human conscience, right? And in a split second, that conscience says, 
you know, get up and help your wife with the baby and, and let her sleep and you go and you go help the baby or you go grab the baby and let your wife, you know, get the deserved and needed rest that she's going to need. So right here, there's the, this, this moment of I'm going to get up and help the baby or I'm not going to get up and help the baby. Right. And this really hits home with me because I've been in that situation and I did just what the story, how it's represented. The guy's name is, uh, I think it's Bob or, or something like that. And, and, and Bob's explaining to Tom, right? And I don't think it's Bob, but this is down right, but let's go with Bob. Bob's explaining that this is what he did when, you know, he was in this situation. He chose not to get up and help the baby. In that moment where he knew that that was really the right thing to do for that split second, he went into self-deception. And self-deception means he didn't take the right turn and he took the left turn instead. He knew he should have took the right turn, but he took the left turn. That's called self-deception. And then what happens right behind self-deception is justification. So we go into self-deception. That's how they term it. And I like that because we're, we're labeling it. We're naming it. What goes on right in that moment that we're all familiar with this, right? And uh, uh, as soon as we go into self-deception, immediately follows self-justification. We get to justify why we took that action. And you have to, you have to go into self-justification in order for you to feel good about the decision you just made. And so what happens is, is we get inside the box right here. We're operating inside the box, making the wrong decision, puts us in a box where we start to self-justify. And what the, let's call him Bob, what Bob immediately begins to do is he glorifies himself. Well, I work hard. I put the food on the table and, you know, I have to go into work. There's not a choice of whether I go into work or not. And I go in and I work hard all day and I deal with people and I have to put out fires and there's a lot of stress with my job. And then what happens is in glorifying ourselves and the self-justification, we start to demean the spouse. So in this case, his wife. So Bob starts to uh, uh, demean his wife. And, and starts to treat her more like an object rather than a human being because he's not worried about her feelings now. He's looking down on her, so to speak, and he's going to demean her by, well, she gets to be here at home. There's no demands that, you know, the employer's putting on her. There's no, there's no deadlines that she has to meet. And so he's justifying himself, pretending like he's not hearing the baby and he's staying asleep. And then eventually his wife will get up and go get the baby. And he could even take that down a road, a, a downward spiral. Well, she's really ungrateful for me. And, you know, uh, she should totally be getting out and understand what I'm going through. So now there starts to be like this, uh, a kind of like a mean-spirited self-demeaning, right? And, 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 that, and it doesn't just end there. It doesn't just stop there. When that happens night after night, it be, starts to become a pattern. And that pattern starts to develop. And then we start to look at our spouses from that perspective he starts to look at his spouse from that perspective throughout the day throughout the weeks because it's become a habitual pattern of how he looks at himself and how he looks at his wife right she eats bonbons and gets to sit on the couch and watch tv and the baby's just taking care of itself and and it's napping during the day and she's on the phone chatting with her friends and he builds up this false scenario around his wife when we really know that she's actually working harder than he is and she doesn't get any time off, right? Not even going to the bathroom. You know, those kids find you when you're in the bathroom, right? And so there's absolutely no time. And, if, and the truth be told, she's working and stressing harder than he is at work, where he's got some freedom. He's got some time where he can go and hide somewhere or take his lunch break or communicate with other adults and things like that. But that's not how he's looking at it here. It's a total different scenario. And that comes through the self-justification, which is never a true perspective on how it really is. He's just got to justify himself for making the wrong decision, right? So if he had made the right decision to get out of bed, it would have created a behavior. It would have created an actual action that he was taking physically. Do you see how there was no action taken here? It was all on an intellectual, let's call it spiritual level. Whereas, uh, as spirit beings, you know, given this physical body to, to work the two together as a spiritual being, it all starts out with thoughts, intelligence, ideas, concepts, and beliefs, right? 
And so that's the only level he was operating on right here. There was no physical action that was taken. It was lack of physical action and it went into justification. Now, if he had taken the steps that he had known to take, that was the better, higher ground to take. Yeah, I'll still be tired when I get up, but I, my wife deserves it. I, she works hard and uh, she's more deserving to sleep in right now because her day is going to be harder than mine. I mean, even just feeling the spirit of that wants to bring tears to my eyes because of the times that I took the left road rather than the right road. Even in just explaining this right now, even though it was years ago, all of our kids are raised now. So I can, I can feel the remorse that I have and, and not honoring and respecting my wife in this moment where I took the left road here. So even just explaining it that way where he took the higher ground and respected and understood and honored his wife, that brings an emotion to me of truth behind it, right? So then what happens is a physical action takes place. It, it was uh, started with an intellect, just like it did here, but it actually produced an action. And, I, and, and Bob gets out of bed, he goes and grabs the baby, and, you know, and, and the rest of the scenario plays out. Well, there was actually an action that took place. It was a productive, progressive, physical action that took place based on making the right decisions for the right reasons instead of the wrong decisions for the wrong reasons. Make sense? So that's called, in the moment, if we go left, that's called self-deception. And then it goes right into self-justification. And, and that's operating inside the box, where we look at people as an object. We're not really um, tapping in to the other person's true feelings as a human being and their needs and their wants. We're thinking only about our own needs and our own wants when we're operating inside the box. When we're operating outside the box, we're looking at the other person as a human being, not as an object. And this is the human, you know, I, I, I wish I could think of the word for it. It's like the, it's the challenge of all human beings is to now operate from the outside the box and treat, you know, others as we would like to be treated ourselves. And I can see after listening to that book, the audio, when I'm in the box and when I'm not in the box you know, with people. And um, I, I, I still want to evolve and get that to a greater and greater awareness uh, with my business and, and with people in general. And, but it's already had a huge profound impact on, on my relationships right here in the home and as a family. So inside the box, outside the box, I'll be using that a lot during this, this, these Zooms in the future here and uh, operating from the outside the box. And we'll be using the self-deception versus and, and self-justification versus getting into action, right? So do you see how we could justify based on these erroneous, out of context, um, incompletes when it comes to truth? It's an incomplete, erroneous uh, a viewpoint or perspective that we have in spite of us looking for the truth and wanting to know the truth. I mean, you feel like I'm going to get the truth, right, when we go to the Bible, but yet we can still take some things out of context. And then with the neural net, we can build those things and make that context even more out of context based on what's in our memory and our experiences of the past. And any kind of uh, things that we might have seen on TV or heard on the radio or heard our parents talk about when it came to rich people and how, you know, the employer who's really wealthy, but you know, is always on vacation and makes us work all the time and whatever conversations we heard and how we can build up from this one point that we heard that was incomplete from a source that we truly trusted. And then we took these other pieces of our paradigm and we built up that and took it even more out of context. Now what's going to happen when it comes to making the decisions that would be taking that head on, contrasted and in the opposite. So when you look at building an isogenics business, it's totally, it's, an, it's unarguable. Isogenics is truly, it has so many divine principles built into it. That's why I call it a divinely inspired company. But yet here are people who can't build this divine business because they feel like it's going against their values. Well, that's a contradiction in and of itself. And you could see how we're doing the contradictive actions. And it's not so clear when we don't know, when we're in that realm of ignorance and, and not quite you know, exposing 
you know, our actions and our beliefs for what they are. So um, going back to what I had written down here now. Um, so the chapter on your right to be rich, until you develop the belief around the essentialness of being rich, so until you develop the belief around how essential it is to be rich and learning the principle, learning that principle and, and truly uh, realizing that being wealthy is not only my right, it's the way that God set it up to move things forward and progress things. When you come to that realization of creating great wealth in your life and being rich, until you come to that belief, deeply seated belief, and the essentialness of it, like it's not optional. In order to move your life and other people's lives forward, for sure within the isogenics realm, um, you've got to become rich. So if, if you have this other incomplete or erroneous belief around getting rich, which one's gonna win out? The one that's the complete belief, the one that you're holding as a value. And then you built that up contextually, you know, with the paradigm and it's become deeply seated. But here's the thing, when we go into that introspection of, okay, so here are people now, they're on the Zoom, and we had this little scenario play out just on this very first week, right? Where Heather had brought that up, somebody else had said, yeah, I've had a problem with that. That's a sticking point for me. You don't, even though you feel like you're introspecting, like you're going inward and you're taking an evaluation and you're surveying things, um, you, can, you can get to a place where you survey that and you've got to, like, you, you're still hanging on to that erroneous incomplete belief that is not based in truth it's based around a false perception contextually around the paradigm that's been built over your lifetime and so we feel like we got to answer that we feel like we got to resolve that and and here's my point when i said you come into this zoom you got to take what's being said when 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 i read the science of getting rich i didn't read it to try and argue the points that were being made in the book I've already tried everything I knew to do in both working and learning um, uh, from a faith-based and from a personal development environment and in that industry, you know, since I was probably about 18, 19 years old, right around there is where I really started getting into it. And by 36 years old, I was as far away from my goals and dreams as I could possibly be. I'd lost my health and, um, uh, I was praying for God to take my life, you know, I'm ready to go um, in spite, and only I know this, how much effort I was putting into learning things and reading books and applying them and working hard, having that hard, eth or, or that hard work ethic and philosophy, and not just thinking that that's the way it should be, but that's the way I was operating my life, and then putting the highest level of quality, like mastering what I was doing, and yet still all of that wasn't working. So when the book was handed to me, I didn't like challenge the things that he was saying. I didn't go to my paradigm and say, or to those old beliefs that I had, they didn't serve me. I had already realized that the way that I had framed things up were not serving me. And I had deeply seated values and beliefs that were incomplete and just erroneous, like this one of you should be content, right? That's coming right from a quoted scripture. So. I didn't like go to that belief. I like, I, I went to the belief that was being, I went to the information that was being taught in the science of getting rich. And I was now starting to build up and frame up things around building that belief and giving all of my attention and focus to that and letting go of the other one, right? And let's see how this plays out. So I'll give you an example, like with Bill Andrews, the geneticist, and when he started teaching about telomeres. I, I had this, like, there's, there's two ways I could go. I could go into, well, that sounds like science fiction. And, you know, th there's no proof of that. There's no reality of anything about telomeres out there. Or I could take the other road and say, I'm going to find out as much as I can about that and really build that up and understand it and build that belief and that knowledge base around telomeres. And, and that's the road I chose to take in spite of this other paradigm that could have went the other direction, right? That left road 
that could have been disbelief, doubtful, skeptical, and then, and then focused on that. I didn't focus on it at all. I suppressed it. And I, and I stayed focused on the belief around gaining as much as I could around telomeres and not looking for why it might be wrong or why my old belief uh, should uh, have any bearing on what I'm now going to learn, right? So that's just kind of an example. I took that route instead of the other one. And I didn't play half in between. I didn't straddle the line. I completely suppressed any beliefs that I had around the lack of knowledge around telomeres and what that could mean for the human body. So I came into the same with, because I saw how it could serve me, like this could serve me knowing something more about that. So there is this thing that happens in the mind that happened in my mind where I could see and play out kind of into the future and see how that could be very serving for myself and humanity. So when I read the science of getting rich, that I didn't, I completely suppressed anything that I might have learned before that would have contradict, contradicted it. I let those go. I wasn't going to let them have any relevance in how I was going to uh, start to implement the things that I was learning and building up a knowledge base and an understanding around that, like devour the book and then see what else I could find around those areas. What other authors are out there that are speaking around this in this way, right? And so I didn't straddle the fence. And that's one of the things that the mind can play a trick on us here is it can say, well, yeah, what about this though? And so again, I just want to kind of draw this as a contrast. So let's see if I can play this a little bit better here, play this out because it's going to be a hard concept to understand um, as I try to articulate this, but I really want you to try and, and understand it and try and, and, and see how this is playing out in your own minds as you're going through this. So, let me, let me just keep reading here. So until you develop the belief around the essentialness of being rich, learning the principle to build your isogenics business will be to some degree in vain or halted or paralyzed until you just suppress whatever is in your mind be from before and start. And what I say by suppress, you can't unlearn what you've learned but you can start to build this concept and start building up the concept greater and greater and seeing with more light around this concept. And if it's truth, there will be a, a greater and greater understanding that's revealed to you. It's a like line, right? And so as you move forward with this, you can see and feel and, and, and start to play out in your mind how this will be serving. This will be a self-serving thing, not just for you, but for others as well. That will start to develop but you can't do that while you're straddling both sides of the fence and hanging on to what's in your paradigm that's contradicting that. And, but hanging on to that is a self-deception. There's a sense of self-deception where you're going to justify hanging on to that while you're reading what Wallace Waddles has to say about what he has to say about your right to be rich. So the mind is very, very subtle and very, very tricky in the way that it will try to get you to self-deceive in hanging on to that, right? Even the Bible says you can't do it. You can't put new wine into old bottles. You can't pick up the plow and, and, and picking up the plow, you can't look back, right? Uh, if you wanna build your life and, and your dreams, the kingdom of heaven is within. So you're not worthy of the kingdom of heaven if you pick up the plow and you look back and every farmer knows you have to keep your eye forward constantly to create those straight rows, right? If you look back, you start going off in, in plowing of the rows. But in this case, looking back means hanging on to and, and self-deception into going into those old beliefs that you framed up as a true belief, right? Um, also, Lot's wife, when they were leaving whatever city that was, uh, she looked back. It's an example, it's a parallel of what's going on with self-deception and these beliefs that we've taken on as beliefs, even though they're not true. They're not based in truth. And so when she looked back, what happened to her? She turned into a pillar of salt. Well, salt is, a, is something that preserves things. And so it will preserve, if we go back to here, whoops, if we go back to here, if you keep looking back to those things, you justify the things that you've learned and you've taken on as a belief that are in your paradigm, you're going to preserve your results that you're getting, right? If you keep doing the same things you've done, you're going to always get 
it, uh, what's the what's the phrase? If you've all if you if you do what you've always done, you're gonna always get what you've always got. Something like that, right? And it's just this vicious cycle that will play over and over. And in here, I quoted like three or four different examples in the Bible of how to not do that, but take the new belief on as a as a the new this new concept that you're being presented, which I'm telling you is truth. It is your right to be rich. And so if you framed up something that says, no, I should be content. If you hang on to that, you're preserving it. Right. And, and like Lot's wife, she looked back. You're looking back to that old erroneous belief that is not based in true principle. And it's going to preserve your condition. It's going to preserve it. That's why she turned into salt. She could have turned into dust or ashes, but no, it had to be salt because salt is something that preserves so that we get the meaning of the teaching, right? So you got to let go of it. Don't go into self-deception, right? And we're naming it to taming it. You can't unlearn what you've learned, but you can start to focus on things in a different way. You can start to build something up in a different way in the way that you're focusing on it and what you're paying attention to, right? So now... Let's go back. So the principle is essential to success. The principle of getting rich is essential to success, at least in the isogenics realm of building a business with isogenics and impacting people's lives, because you can become successful in other things. You know, uh, let's just, as being a parent, you could be very, very successful, more successful than you currently are uh, as a parent, but you're not going to get a compensation monetarily for doing that, but you will, you could become more successful as a parent. Right. But in this realm with isogenics, it's essential. You become rich. You can't separate them. They're synonymous success in isogenics means that you will become wealthy. Right. So if that's the case and yet you have a problem with getting rich because of this, this paradigm, this being content and holding that as a value, if that value is going to be the stronger of the two, then, the, then you're going to be stifled in your behavior. Your subconscious will totally control your behavior. It's doing it right now. Your subconscious is blinking your eyes. It's beating your heart. It's pumping your heart and the blood through your, it's, it's expanding and contracting your lungs. The subconscious is the most powerful force that we know nothing really about, right? So, um, a successful isogenics business is synonymous with being rich. So to have the desire to create a successful isogenics business and at the same time have a negative outlook at wealth are at odds. And the dominant feeling, which is the one that's subconscious, is going to win out every single time. It wins out every single time. So until we spend more time on ourselves and we overcome that subconscious belief and we start to reprogram ourselves, so to speak, or rewire our paradigm, which takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of focus, a lot of willpower, because you're going to have to do it consciously at this point. Consciously, you're going to have to override that airplane's mechanical guidance system. That's always bringing the airplane back on course. You've got to go head on with that. And the only way you can do that is consciously. So you're going to take on your subconscious consciously. It's going to take a lot of will. It's going to take a lot of, you know, commitment and discipline on your part. So let me go back into uh, this here. Sorry about the printer. Somebody in the house is printing something up and uh, just make a little bit of noise. Um, so when hearing the new belief, giving yourself permission to believe and take on the concept as a belief. So uh, hearing this right to be rich, and I told you that I gave an affirmation that I started saying to myself, I'm so grateful now that I have the unrestricted free use of time, money, and resources, and I can do what I want, when I want, for as long as I want, right? That's a new affirmation. So what I'm doing is I was able to frame up a new idea a new image of myself, a new concept of myself um, based on this belief that I was being taught, even though it was going against my paradigm, right, in, in certain aspects. So there is a betrayal in not taking that action. 
All right, so now I'm, I, I, I wrote it out on a three by five card, this new belief. I'm so happy and grateful now that I have the unrestricted free use of time, money, and resources, and I can do what I want, when I want, for as long as I want. I'm so grateful that, you know, $1,000 a week is going into my bank account from Isagenix. It's just deposited every week. I'm so grateful for that, and that my team's rocking, and that people's lives are changing. Do you see how I'm rewiring on a conscience le con conscious, conscious level? Like, I know that I'm doing that. It's at the forefront of my mind, and it's on a conscience, conscious, conscious level, right? It's not subconsciously believing that. In fact, my subconscious is still believing what it's always believed. But I wrote it down on a three by five card and scripted it out. There are some people's subconscious that is so powerful, they can't even get themselves to write that out in a, in a it's already accomplished kind of way. Because did you notice how I frame that up? I'm so happy and grateful now that, now that I am not going to be, or if I work this hard enough someday on this day, I'll have that. I wrote it up as though I already have it. Some people, they'll let their paradigm override their ability to physically take the action and write it down. And they go into that self-betrayal. Now they immediately, because they didn't take the action, they go into justification. They come up with all the reasons why they're not worthy of that or why it's not possible. Okay, watch that. Whenever you don't take an action that you know you should take, like every one of us should be writing out that affirmation. I'm so happy and grateful now that I have the unrestricted free use of time, money, and resources. And I can do what I want when I want for as long as I want. If you don't take that action, pay very close attention. You're immediately going to go into self-justification because you didn't take the action. So immediately you have to go into justification and watch how your paradigm is going to frame that up. Start to become aware of that. So there's a betrayal that takes place every time we don't take an action. Now, do not look to the contrary belief and hold, at, hold that as to the reason to not believe. Okay, so that's what kind of was taking place in, the per, in, in somebody who wrote in the comments after Heather had shared that. Yeah, that's been a sticking point for me, that particular quote right out of the Bible. You see what they did? They already went into justification mode and went to that rather than taking the action and taking on the new belief and building that up because they haven't got that as a belief yet. They haven't proven. They haven't framed up a paradigm that has all of these reasons as to why that is the case. And so they went into a self-betrayal already. And, and watch how the mind does that. It's very tricky. The point that I really wanted to make, that particular person, and I would say every single one of us do that, but I get to hold that out as a contrast and use particular individuals and what their actions were in this case, right, just on that Zoom. So again, not pointing out and, and judging anybody, but actually honoring that person for us to be able to take on uh, this awareness that we're now able to talk about and, and draw the contrast between it. So <coughs> I need some water. <clears throat> um, do you see how the brain did that? And they went into a justification. What was the justification? Well, that scripture that I had read. Where when I got the science of getting rich, I didn't allow my mind to do that. I had already decided with my willpower and my focus, I'm going to take the new beliefs and focus on and build those and completely, how did I say it earlier? Uh, not ignore. I used ignore and suppress, but that wasn't it. I totally, uh, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I gave no life to it. Um, it was like it didn't exist in me. I just uh, cut it off, basically. Right? It's still there, and I can't unlearn that, and I can't you know, uh, deny that that's a feeling and a belief that I have, but I, in a sense, ignored it. I wish I could think of the word that I thought of before, but I basically uh, totally focused and kept my attention and my sights on the new beliefs that I was learning from the book. And I started building those up rather than going into self-justification with the already old beliefs. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, you can't straddle the fence. You gotta take the amygdala head on, you gotta take your paradigm head on, and you gotta think to yourself or say, okay, well, if this is the new image that I'm gonna take on for myself, if I draw that out, where does that lead to? If I start building up, 
you know, that I have the unrestricted free use of time, money, and resources, and whatever amount of money is going into my bank account, let's say $500 a week, or $1,000 a week, or $5,000 a week. Where does that lead to? Is that good? Like, the, the, what are all the ramifications of that? And as you play that out, you have to agree, wow, there's some pretty amazing things that are happening in people's lives on a pretty big scale to be having, you know, $1,000 a week being top, deposited into my bank account every week. And so therefore, I can continue to cling to that because I'm going down a road that isn't leading to self-destruction and destructing other people's lives as well, right? And so uh, now you can even start to see an even more correct perspective of, well, that's in a complete contradiction to I should have been content. Now you can start to see clearly the, the opposite beliefs that you had towards what you were wanting and what you were wanting to be in the world and the impact and what you were holding as a belief. And then you start to see that more clearly, not only in yourself, but in others and, and how that actually becomes a sticking point. And it just doesn't make sense. There's no common sense to that. And, you, and so you start to become more aware. So do not look to the contrary belief you held as to the reason to not believe, right? Don't go to there, don't give it, that's self-justification. And by you going to that and recognizing it and bringing it up, you already went in, you already lost. The fact that you bring it up, you're already in, I'll, I'll say it this way just to really make it extreme, you're already in loser mode if you bring it up because you've already accepted that contradiction as a, as a fact as a belief and as something contrary to your values. When really becoming wealthy and isogenics is more in alignment with your values, making an, an impact in people's lives in the areas that it matters most, right? So if, if you're going to that place, your mind already tricked you into getting there and you already made the decision. So we do that ignorantly, right? Just like how I was behaving and going into self-betrayal and justification, not knowing it back when we were raising our kids and they were newborns, right? I'm not blaming or pointing at the, you know, the person who brought that up in the comments. All of us do that. Now we're able to see it because we do it because we don't see it. And this has given us the opportunity to see it. So you immediately go into justification where no new behavior is taking place. So by going there, you're already going to continue to do the same things you've always done. So you're going to do the same things you've always got without even knowing you've already taken yourself there. And that's why the phone calls aren't made. That's why you're not doing the, the practicing your scripts and standing in front of the mirror, doing mirror work or whatever it is to improve your skills around your approach with isogenics, right? So you're not doing those behaviors because you, your mind and your subconscious already justified you not doing those behaviors. You see how that works? It's so freaking amazing when you can see how obvious it is after you've seen it. Um, I hope that's making sense. Like I'm getting it even deeper just trying to articulate this to you guys. Um, the justification is keeping you from practicing and mastering, approaching people, following up with people. I mean, it's keeping you from doing all of the skill stuff. And, and sometimes we'll get to where we do practice some of them. But I would say if your justification is in your old paradigm and you wouldn't be doing them, you wouldn't be doing the three by five cards, you wouldn't be practicing those every morning, you wouldn't be practicing your script, you wouldn't be putting together your own kind of presentations because that's a behavior. And the justification and the self-betrayal is gonna keep you from doing those behaviors. So do you see that? So thinking is the behavior uh, as well. Thinking is a behavior. So it's right at that moment of decision, you're going to the left or to the right. Well, going to the left, even though it's not a physical, it's a justification, thinking is still a behavior, right? So you start to build a foundation of reverse engineering, build the case for the new truth, and it's re-evaluating, script it out, put it into a positive affirmation, and start reprogramming the guidance system, your subconscious. So the only way you can do that is what is known as affirmations. But you gotta do the affirmations the right way and for the right reasons, how you do them, why you do them. And we're gonna get into that as we move forward 
and I'll show you exactly how I did that for building my isogenics business. Um, but the only way you're going to reprogram that, it's going to take a lot of work. And that's where anybody who's reached the success uh, and they see other people reach success, we admire those people. We're not jealous of them. We, we recognize the work they've done on themselves, which is very admirable and worthy of receiving that, those accolades because they did it. They took the willpower and the time and the discipline that it took to reprogram their guidance system, their subconscious. And it's not for the pain of heart, right? But I believe as we can make this more and more clear for people and really understand that self, uh, uh, the self-deception and uh, then going into the justification, the self-betrayal and then going into justification, you'll start to see that you've been doing that to yourself. And the more you see that, the more you'll laugh at it and you'll start to take on another course of action. So you have to take on a new belief. You can internalize and still betray yourself. So this is what I wanna say about this, doing this Zoom. You can start to internalize. That person was totally internalizing that made the comment. But even in the internalization process, you could still stay in the box. You can still be self-betraying and totally stay in the box. In fact, most people do. They internalize, they take that internal, you know, self-evaluation and trying to figure things out, trying to move their lives forward, but they're doing it while they're staying in the box because they already lost because they went to the old belief and justified that belief and didn't take on the new one and start building it up and start creating the knowledge and understanding around that new belief. So what my uh, uh, course of action is gonna be here, your, your um, what's it called? call to action is these, these new concepts and these new beliefs that Wallace Waddles is bringing up, immediately go into focusing on and building them and understanding them so that you can take that on as the new belief and don't go back to the old belief as to why, you know, I'm stuck. That's the deception that the brain can keep you in. And it's very subtle. So no wonder we need mentors. No wonder we need authors. No wonder we need you know, communication from people who have already found the answers. It makes a huge difference because there's no way you would identify these things on your own. There's no way I would have been able to identify the things that I've identified now just recently from reading Leadership and Self-Deception. I needed those mentors. I needed those teachers. I needed to be able to hear that. And then, you know, the true desire to want to grow and move forward and take the actions that it's going to take for me to be the person that I want to be. You know, do you really want it? So uh, with that, I know I went a little long. Well, I don't, I don't want to went a little long. I need more action of trying to get to uh, the point of this. Um, but again, the call to action, these new beliefs and truths that you're hearing, cling to them. Cling to that. Let that be the thing and don't preserve by looking back. Don't turn into a pillar of salt by going back to, well, but this is what's in my belief system. Don't do that. Start to take on the new one and then frame that up with affirmations around that new belief as you get more and more clarity around, well, what does that principle of becoming rich really mean to me? Well, it means that I would be able to do what I want when I want. Okay, so let's write that out. If that's how my life would be, let's write that out and script that. Because what you're going to do is you're going to start bringing up these other different areas that you can create in your paradigm as a puzzle, just like your paradigm already has taken all these other misconceptions, half-truths or erroneous, completely false concepts. And they're all like dot to dots, uh, like a dot to dot puzzle picture where you now frame them up. You need to do the same thing with the new belief. You need to create these dot to dots that will reinforce each one. And then you just keep reiterating them. And as you do that, the truth is stronger. I mean, the light is stronger than the darkness. It gets rid of the darkness immediately. It's going to take some willpower and some discipline and some time on your side, on your part. But the truth always overcomes the faults. So, but you, but you do have to do your part and start creating that stuff. Start creating that dot to dot to where you can uh, uh, reaffirm each one of them and compound them, right? The more you compound them, the more they make sense. The light of truth is now dispelling on you, like the light of, you know, like the sun in the morning starting to get brighter and brighter. Um, all right, so I'm gonna stop there and hopefully that will help some of you to
understand what's going on inside of you already at this very beginning stages because this is happening right away. And it's that self-betrayal and very slightly unnoticeably is gonna go into the justification and hang on to that and not allow you to do the actions that you're gonna to need to do to start changing your results. So we need to recognize that right up front, all right? Okay, see you guys later.